Hey everybody, it's Byron. I'm here in the 2021 Ford Bronco. We are finally driving it. We're here in hot, sweaty Austin, Texas. We're going to take this thing out on the road today. Tomorrow we're going to take it off the road. And I'm going to get you a few snapshots here, care of this handy dandy little accessory mount that Ford has included right on the dash of the car. Check that out. You can actually record everything you're doing so that all of your shenanigans can be memorialized on whatever platform you happen to like. Siri's going crazy, so I'm going to shut this off and start driving this thing. All right, everybody, we are driving the 2021 Ford Bronco, as promised, and uh, we're out here on the hills, just west and north, I guess, of Austin, Texas. This is very much an on-road portion of the drive. We won't actually get to get these things really dirty until tomorrow, but uh, I gotta say, uh, so far, I'm pretty impressed by the way this thing handles. We've got a few qualms here and there, but uh, so far so good. This is a, a very impressive machine. I'm in a four-door soft top. It's pretty quiet, even on these not amazing road surfaces. Texas uh, has plenty of roads, but most of them are crappy, this one included. I gotta say, the noise level from somebody like myself who drives a soft top Jeep Wrangler is actually really impressive in here. Uh, they've done a good job insulating it. The long wheelbase of this car helps a little bit with road imperfections and noise and stuff like that. But I mean, just taking it holistically, I gotta say I'm pretty impressed. I'm hustling this probably faster than most of their typical owners would on a road like this. But it's giving me a chance to kind of feel out the differences between the independent front and the solid rear axle. It's different. It, it still feels, Ford's gonna hate to hear this, it feels like a Jeep in the ways that matter but it doesn't in a few key ways that also matter. And so far, pretty impressed. All right, folks, well, I'm sitting here enjoying a little bit of ice cream because it is hot as whatever you think is hot here in Texas. And I need this to cool down a little bit because if I run the air conditioning while I do these videos, you can't hear me. So I wanna talk a little bit about Bronco just kind of in general. The car I'm driving right now is an Outer Banks. This is kind of the equivalent to a Jeep Wrangler Sahara, give or take. It's the more upscale, more luxurious model, if there is such a thing when it comes to a 4x4. So with this one, it's focused a little bit more around the comfort and the tech and the style. It's the look of an off-roader. It's not necessarily all the capability of an off-roader. However, unlike Jeep, Ford allows you to actually put the more capable packages even on a vehicle like this. So you can get an Outer Banks with a Sasquatch package, which adds your locking differentials, your big tires, all of that, no problem. Jeep, can't do that. Can't do that on a Sahara, you have to go for Rubicon. So when we talk about the Wild Track and the Badlands versions of the Ford Bronco being the hardcore Rubicon equivalents, the truth of the matter is that any Bronco can be a Rubicon equivalent, provided you spend a few thousand dollars, and I think it's about 4,500 bucks, to get the Sasquatch package. You can add that on base model, you can add it onto a Badlands if that's what you want to do. But the capability is there even in the most basic form, provided you add on those options, which is a nice thing that Jeep doesn't let you do. If you're going to do that in Jeep Wrangler, you buy a Sport or a Sport S, and then you go to the aftermarket. Now, as we've seen from Jeep since the Bronco was announced, they're kind of making some moves to adjust that, and they're starting to add more little packages. Now, so far, we've only seen it with the Rubicon, with the new Extreme Recon package, which would kind of be like the equivalent of Sasquatch in that they both offer 35-inch tires, a little extra ground clearance, a little extra capability, but it's really unfair to compare them because you can't get the Extreme Recon package on a lower-end Wrangler. It has to be a Rubicon or a Rubicon 392. So Ford's really got a leg up on Jeep when it comes to the general packaging and cost advantages of building the more enthusiast models. Now, there are still some catches. Uh, you have to wait for model year 2022 to get a Sasquatch package with a manual transmission, things like that. But as this progresses and Ford starts to actually crank more of these out, we're gonna see a lot of people who are really happy with the fact that they can get what they want for a lot less money than it would cost them at a Jeep dealer. All right, so we are out on the freeway now. We're doing a good, you know, 60 miles an hour. We're finally getting a little bit of wind noise from this top. And while I've got you, I actually want to talk about one more thing that bothers me a little bit about this car. And this is a, a very minor quibble, and it's Ford's 10-speed automatic transmission, which, by and large, is actually a very nice transmission. It's calibrated pretty well in most applications. There are some issues here and there with the Ranger and stuff like that, but 
for the most part, they've kind of gotten it figured out, and it's in basically every rear-wheel drive vehicle they sell. So it's everywhere, it works. There's just one little thing that bothers me about it, and that's that Ford is so hesitant to put paddle shifters on its automatic transmissions for some reason, and this is one of them. Now, it does have manual gear selection on the gear selector, and it does have a manual mode, but manual mode is just essentially holding the gear. It doesn't actually put it in a mode that lets you shift manually. So essentially what you have to do in order to manually select gears in this car is put it in manual mode and then click little up and down buttons on the shifter to actually select gears. So it's, it's very counterintuitive. The only other company that really does it is GM. And while it works on paper, it's really awkward to use in practice. Paddle shifters, guys. It's really simple. If we're going to do manual mode, just do paddle shifters. Okay, so we are coming to the end of our on-road drive in the new Ford Bronco. And uh, the verdict is very good. This is a very nice vehicle to drive on the road. It's worth pointing out that this vehicle is not equipped with a Sasquatch package, so it does not have the larger off-road tires, which will cause quite a bit more road noise than the kind of, uh, these are, this still has all terrains on it, but they're not nearly as aggressive. But the soft top and the combination of those tires, the sound deadening that they've done with this, it makes for a very pleasant drive. And we were doing some uh, twisty roads there with 45 to 55 mile an hour speed limits and we were able to keep up with traffic just fine. So honestly, not many things to complain about with this, apart from the, the minor quibbles we have with the transmission and the inability to easily manually shift it. And you know, just little things here and there where it doesn't feel like this is, say, perhaps the most premium vehicle, but that's really more for Land Rover, right? The Defender is the well-off off-roaders vehicle. Now you can argue Mercedes goes even more extreme with the Jeep, fine sure. But with, for the amount of money you're spending, this is the sweet spot. This is where you want to be. It's here or it's Jeep Wrangler. And they're the only two body-on-frame off-road vehicles being sold in the United States that are dedicated to the mainstream market. Everything else is expensive, unibody, both, or a crossover, right? So this is the sweet spot. All right, folks, so this is day two of the 2021 Ford Bronco drive continued, and we are now on the off-road course. We're actually on the most difficult of the three courses they prescribed for us. So we started with the little one, which was called Jalapeno. We moved up to the mid-grade one, which was Habanero, and now we're at Ghost Pepper because Texas, I guess. So um, I'm in a base car for this track, and honestly, it's really performing quite well. Now, there's a caveat to that. It's a base car with the Sasquatch package because, as I mentioned before, you can get that on any trim level of Bronco. So with the Sasquatch, you get a lift, you get the larger all-terrain tires, you get the front and rear lockers, the trail turn assist, and that's really all this car is equipped with, quite frankly. Apart from that, it's a pretty base spec vehicle. And that's one of the nice things about the Bronco is that you can actually build a cheap one with the better off-road goodies, which if you were to buy a Wrangler in order to do that, you'd basically have to go to the aftermarket. So we're doing some rock crawling here, uh, lots of spotting. It's uh, kind of slow going. So this is a real opportunity to see how this does in an environment where you really need ground clearance, where you need the locking differentials. There's a couple of these obstacles we couldn't have cleared without them. So uh, having a blast with this thing, it is killing it. <laughs> All right. Sometimes, sometimes we just need a little bump to get over the hump. Hey. And it goes. But I do appreciate your uh, throttle control and not just hammering down right away. Thanks, Brian. Sure.
So really, it boils down to this. Jeep has had this segment to itself for decades at this point, especially when we're talking about compact 4x4 off-roaders with a soft top option or a removable top or something like that. Jeep has been the only game in town. And when you have that kind of monopoly over a certain segment, that's naturally going to lead to stagnation. There's really little incentive to innovate. And we've seen ever since rumblings of the Broncos revival, that Jeep has actually started to pay a little bit more attention to what it offers with the Wrangler. We've gone from one engine option with the last generation to six, seven, depending on how you count them with the current generation. And that's a direct response to Jeep seeing Bronco coming. And frankly, even what they've done is not nearly enough. The price discrepancy when it comes to capability between these two cars is frankly egregious. We're talking five or $6,000 differences in terms of basic off-road capability. When you're talking about a base 2021 Ford Bronco with the Sasquatch package, including the big tires and all the other stuff we've already mentioned, you're looking at about thirty-seven dollars to $38,000 entry point once you add Sasquatch. To get the equivalent package on a Jeep Wrangler, you have to buy a Rubicon, which starts at $41,000 and doesn't even include all of that equipment standard. And if you want 35s and all that kind of stuff, you have to then add on the Extreme Recon package for Rubicon, which is even more money. Jeep hasn't said exactly how much yet, but more. So we're talking about at least a five dollars to $6,000 gap in between these two cars for equivalent capability. That's huge. And on top of that, the Bronco has a lot more going for it. Put simply, the independent front suspension pays huge dividends. After we finished our on-road drive in the four-door Outer Banks model, we grabbed four-door Wrangler Sahara that Ford brought along so we could do a little on-road comparison. Compared to the Bronco, its front end just feels kind of sloppy and disconnected. Even just going straight on the highway requires a lot more correction in the Wrangler than it does in the Bronco. And as a Wrangler owner, I hadn't even noticed that that was the case. It's something that you don't really see until someone offers you an alternative, and that's what Ford has done here. A lot of the reason why that's true is that you need a lot more compliance engineered into a solid axle suspension setup to keep it from being completely miserable in terms of ride quality. And this is even more obvious when things get a little trickier. The Bronco steering just feels tight and more precise. And even when you get into rough road surfaces or roads with, say, large bumps and imperfections that are only present in half the lane, so that you're kind of tossing the right or the left side of the car, but not the entire thing, independent suspension really shines here. And that's what the majority of buyers want. There's no downside to an independent front suspension for somebody who isn't going to off-road the car. And frankly, for the people who are, it's really not that big of a deal if the suspension was properly engineered for the application, which is exactly what we have here. This is a chassis that's been used in the Ford Ranger, which has a Raptor variant overseas. It's a truck chassis meant to do truck things. Now, this may not convince you if you're a hardcore 4x4 buyer who doesn't care about anything except proven durability. But remember, even the Wrangler at this point is venturing into a lot of unknown territory. So when you're talking about Wrangler being a known quantity and Bronco not, Eh, those lines are starting to get a little blurred. And keep this in mind, too. Ford is going into a segment of one and turning it into a segment of two. They're doubling the number of choices you have. You have Wrangler right now. You're going to have Wrangler or Bronco. That's a big deal. This is very high profile. It's a very narrow niche. There are going to be a lot of people who care about how the Bronco performs off-road in the hands of owners. And Ford's leadership knows that they can't afford to half-ass this. This has to be the real deal. It has to be truly competitive with the Wrangler in order to be taken seriously by the crowd they're trying to attract. There might be compromises to independent front suspension, but ask yourself this. Do you really think Ford would have risked the level of embarrassment that they would experience by delivering a truck that couldn't hang with the one truck it absolutely has to hang with. If the Bronco can't keep up with the Wrangler, and that includes durability down the line, then Ford is in trouble. That's the kind of reputation that trickles down really quickly. And you know this, you hear it from anybody who's actually beaten on their cars. They take that stuff seriously, and they will be vocal if things go wrong. Ford does not want that. This suspension is set up to do the job. And that is kind of the heart 
of what makes the new Bronco so good. This chassis is fantastic. The options they've thrown onto it make it even better. The price advantage it has over Wrangler is huge, especially in terms of capability. And they hit all the other points that matter to people who aren't interested in capability. Comfort, style, the interior packaging, the exterior packaging, the ease of removing tops, sides, you name it. This is the real deal. It is a total package. It is competitive. It is actually superior in several ways to its key competitor. This is how you come into a segment like this and make waves. Ford's hit a home run with this.